Welcome to all of you. It's certainly good to have you here with us. And thanks to Jeff Bradshaw and for uh, many for their tireless efforts in making this virtual conference possible and uh, great papers and wonderful insights that we've been able to enjoy interconnecting in so may, many ways with each other. I'm also very grateful to uh, Jackson Apau, a, uh, a student here at BYU in the Ancient Near Eastern Studies program who has been my research assistant for over a year and has served me very proficiently. I also thank several reviewers who have helped with the formation of this thesis and paper, including my wife, Jeannie, and all have given very helpful feedback. I wish to share with you today a way of receiving the text of the Book of Moses that looks primarily at who Moses might have been and what his influences are in issuing this text and where it went from him. I think that what we can say from what we have here is that we can see it better now, understanding it as a, a translation of an Israelite priestly text. Our topic and contribution to this conference is titled Priestly Interests of the Book of Moses, the Levite. Jackson and I got started on this project when we got thinking about the significance of Moses being a member of the tribe of Levi. How might that help us in understanding the Book of Moses better? That one question set off a cascade of interesting lines of research for us. Our presentation today will just report four of them, as we will show the words of Moses zealously articulate God's priesthood, precepts, and covenants, reveal temple themes and sacred knowledge, as we've seen in several of the papers already in this conference, reflect a surprising array of Levitical priestly terms, and establish practical duties that the Levites would traditionally fulfill. So first off, the words of Moses on many occasions do indeed zealously articulate God's priesthood. Why might this be interesting and significant? Well, taken together, these four characteristics describe the Book of Mormon and indeed for these reasons and others, we've come to see Moses' leadership as the paragon of the prototypical high priest, even above that of his brother Aaron, who functioned in that office. This priestly insight has helped us to appreciate better Moses, not only in the Hebrew Scriptures generally, but even more so in the book that we celebrate today, which bears his name. Indeed, as our research affirms, Moses should be recognized as the founding member of the Levitical priestly order in the house of Israel. Moses married the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian, Exodus 2.16, which is in line with the strict requirement that the high priest must be married to a faithful wife, as stated in Leviticus 21. And Moses was called personally by God in his very presence just as the high priest alone would have the privilege of entering into the Holy of Holies, there to encounter the deity face to face. Although critical commentaries have hastily doubted just about anything you can imagine about Moses personally, there can be no doubt that the Bible repeatedly and widely affirms the existence of both his father and his mother, and that they were members of the tribe of Levi, as stated in Exodus 2 and 6, as well as in other passages in Judges and Chronicles. As John Bright has famously observed, the events of Exodus and Sinai require a great personality behind them. To deny that role to Moses would force us to posit another person of that same name. End of quote. And that person indeed was the Levite named Moses. In addition to the biblical witness that Moses was led by God, 
Latter-day Saint revelations in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants affirm that Moses was a historical figure and that his ordination by Jethro connected Moses with Abraham, Melchizedek, Enoch, and Adam. See Doctrine and Covenants 84, 6 through 14. Strikingly, the Levites were known for being zealous, vigilant, protective, and loyal, as Moses himself was on many instances in his long life. For example, when he came down off of Mount Sinai, Moses saw the Israelites engaged in idolatry. In response, he withheld from the people the first set of laws, and he called out, Who's on the Lord's side? And in answer, it was the sons of Levi who came running. It is not widely noticed, but at the end of Deuteronomy, when Moses was granting land rights to the tribes, he prayed, which was a priestly function, to God on behalf of his fellow Levites and said, Let thy Thummim and Urim, priestly artifacts, be with your faithful tribe of Levi, whom you tested at Massa, where they alone had put the Lord's precepts ahead of heeding even father and mother and children. Deuteronomy 33, 8-9. through 9. Their defensive zeal, in many ways following Moses' own example, was the origin of the Levites' custody over the Urim and Thummim, powerful, sacred instruments. As we will point out below, righteous zeal also comes crucially to play in the book of Moses. And in that regard, because some have wondered how far back in history priestly sources and traditions may run, we think it is worth noting that people have greater reason today than ever before to agree that some priestly texts have roots that run well before the Babylonian exile. The discovery of these two tiny silver scrolls in Jerusalem, with the high priest's blessing from number six inscribed on them in Paleo-Hebrew from before 600 B.C., gives us the oldest surviving example of any biblical text, and it is unquestionably a priestly text. Our second interest in our project is in showing that many temple interests are clearly articulated in the book of Moses. If a reader only knows what he's looking for, temple elements of which there are many abound within this text. The temple was obviously of great interest to the Levites and likewise to Moses, who gave the instructions and guided the construction and operation of the tabernacle, the predecessor of the temple. These elements were uh, important to the Levites, who themselves were priestly writers of the Old Testament, and likewise in the book of Moses. Consider the significant formulas used to portray God in theophanies. If transcendental deity of the putative priestly writers was representative of prevailing priestly interests, we should expect God of the book of Moses to be similarly portrayed. But we should also expect reports of face-to-face -face interactions between God and humanity to be rare. And we should expect the vast gap between God and humanity to be emphasized. And we should expect God to communicate mainly through mediation of his voice and his words, as Matt Bowen has so well described for us. Two face-to-face -face heavenly uh, theophanies, of course, are found in the book of Moses, which in effect act as bookends. The first vision in chapter 1 is seen by Moses, and the second is shown to Enoch. Neither have any textual equivalents in Genesis. It's worthwhile to explore the similarities between these two experiences. On both occasions, the gap between God and man is highlighted, as one would expect in a priestly text, but divine aid is offered in both cases to the prophet, which allows him to endure the transcendent divine presence and glory. Both prophets are overwhelmed by the infinite number of God's creations, and both receive a vision 
of all things, uh, including the final destiny of the world. Beyond that, God's behavior elsewhere in the Book of Mormon is even more distant and reserved as one also would expect from a priestly or Levitical perspective. The word voice appears 18 times and words appear 17 times in the Book of Moses, referring to the typical manner in which he mediates his will in P, also not, but also not exclusively in P. Conversely, when humanity needs to communicate with God, the typical supplication formula is call upon God, although for Enoch it is typically cry unto God. God also often is encountered in esoteric or cultic contexts, the phrases involving before and in the presence of and the face of God, which occur a combined number of 25 times in the book of Moses, all likely represent an original Hebrew expression, meaning in the face or before Jehovah or Elohim. And more than half of these are in sections that are original to Moses and are not found in Genesis. As Menachem Haran argues, uh, this Hebrew phrase often connotes a cultic setting. While the book of Moses does not recount the building of any temples, the phrase before the Lord indicates that the priestly ceremonial activities are an ongoing element throughout all stages of this text. Divine names are important. Another hallmark of P is its Presentation of, presentation of the divine names. Following Exodus 6.3, most scholars of the documentary hypothesis argue that in P, God is first introduced as Elohim, then at his covenant with Abraham as El Shaddai, and finally with Moses as Yahweh. While one has no obligation to rigidly adopt this historical compartmentalization of the divine names, it is intriguing to note that all three of P's divine names make an appearance in the book of Moses. Elohim appears 134 times as God. El Shaddai appears three times as God Almighty or Lord God Almighty. And Yahweh appears 95 times as Lord, with an additional 39 occurrences of Yahweh Elohim as Lord God. In addition, more names are introduced in Moses too, the beginning and the end, the Almighty God. In 657, the man of holiness. In 735, man of counsel, endless, eternal. Showing further that the names of deity are a major characteristic of the book of Moses as they are for P. Our third, a research focus, shows more than we expected that priestly terminology is abundant in the book of Moses. In determining which terms have been typically associated with priestly provenances, we have used Hebrew lexicons, particularly Brown Driver Briggs, that include notes on the documentary sources usually associated with various Hebrew words. These dictionaries add letters for J, for E, for H, and for P sources in parentheses with the biblical references under each of the respective uh, definitions used. Uh, using these biblical references under each of the respective definitions has been helpful to our textual project, quite independent of whether the doc documentary hypothesis should be viewed as historical or not. The most prominent of these words is creation. The creation is often assumed, words associated with creation. Creation is often assumed to be a primary uh, priestly interest, and while it is read readily a prominent theme in Genesis 1 through 6, the additional Moses material even further reinforces its importance. Moses 1, all unique material, is focused on the purpose of creation. The unique material that appears amid the creation accounts of Genesis 1 to 2 and Moses 2 to 3 adds priestly emphasis to the existing Genesis accounts. In the first creation account, the unique material 
six times clarifies that the creation was accomplished through God's word and power. The priestly interest in order is then also manifested in other ways in the book of Moses. Time is divided accordingly into divinely ordained epics, demarcated by phrases like the beginning, the meridian of time, the end of the world, and thousands of years. This cosmic time division is especially prominent in Enoch's vision in Moses 7. The idea of a priestly order is found in Moses 6.67 and 8.19. Genealogies are also kept in the book of Moses, and Moses 6 even explains the holy motivation behind the maintenance of Adam's genealogy. Two other priestly interests that are important here are glory and holiness, and they are prominent in the book of Moses. Glory, kabod, in various forms occurs 22 times in Moses. Perhaps the greatest interest of P is the maintenance of God's holiness, kodesh, and holy in its various forms appears 18 times in the book of Moses. The city of Enoch is described as the city of holiness and as the holy city. A twice introduced epithet for God is man of holiness, for the transcendent sacrosanct God of Leviticus. And in addition to the foregoing terms, several other obvious terms relating to priestly interests are found in the book of Moses, especially priesthood, holy ordinance, and ordained. These terms are not among those highlighted by scholars on the priestly source in discussing the Genesis material, but that's probably just because those terms don't appear in Genesis. So in this way, the book of Moses is even more priestly, we can say, than the putative pre-source, priest, priestly source itself. Conversely, P is very much concerned about agents of pollution that can defile holy things. Many of these possible pollu pollutants, such as wickedness, sin, transgression, corruption, bloodshed, filthiness, and especially Satan, the accuser, and motivation be behind all of these, are major concerns especially mentioned in the book of Moses. The presence of these pollutants is much more impress imminent and defiling in the book of Moses than even in Genesis. All of this terminological evidence is presented in our Appendix 1, which is 24 pages long. It breaks the full text of Moses into 66 blocks or units. Bolded words, as you see here, are words that are found in Moses but not in Genesis. Words in yellow have priestly connotations, and words in red which are relatively infrequent, are priestly words that appear both in Moses and in Genesis. Most of these 66 units in the book of Moses strongly employ priestly vocabulary. Only two of the 66 units use no priestly terms. 47 of them use four, and in most cases, many more. For example, in the first block, uh, all of the words are bolded here because uh, these words are unique uh, to the book of Moses. Many words are in yellow, exposing the strong interest of the priestly nature of this particular block of Moses' text. Here in this next shorter section, found in Moses 3, this aligns with Genesis 2, whose verses typically are identified as coming from the priestly source. Notice that the bolded additions made by the book of Moses report God as speaking in the first person, I and my, which is more immediate and naturally more primary than the Genesis third person account uh, given in the uh, traditional text. In the account of the Premortal Rebellion of Satan in Moses, uh, chapter 4, all of which is unique to the book of Moses. Notice especially priestly elements of name, redeem, 
honor, chosen, glory, and forever. Interestingly, Jesus recounted to the chief priests in the temple in Jerusalem in Matthew 21, which was in a priestly context, this very premortal dichotomy between the willing and the unwilling two sons. Another unit from Moses 5, all unique material with no Genesis counterpart, contains words, as you see, like holy, forever, redeemed, blessed, name of God, seed, eternal, all of which are definitely priestly terms, with several others, depending on the context, that can be priestly. Obviously, none of these many unique Book of Moses units can simply be maligned as mere modifications of the text in Genesis. Our Appendix 2 then lists alphabetically for convenience all 136 of these terms that we've identified so far as priestly terms in the Book of Moses, showing also with each one of them in parentheses afterward how often each term appears. Our Appendix 3 then clusters these words according to their frequency within the text of Moses. For example, the words appearing five times uh, within the book of Moses seem to gravitate toward things like God's appearance, His covenant, sanctity, and extending His merciful voice of sworn promising. And curiously, words related to blood and offering appear nine times each, an accidental coincidence perhaps, but the word Holy Ghost and presence appear exactly ten times each, the number of perfection. Twelve is a number associated typically with governance and in this text also with power. I don't know what to make of these numbers numerologically, but it is true that the priests were very concerned with dates, numbers, counting, measuring, and being sure that their texts contained all of the words that they should contain. Notice here that the two most frequently occurring priestly terms in the book of Moses are glory 22 times and created 32 times. Certainly all of these are very dominant priestly interests throughout this text. And our appendices can also be used as this last one. As you read through your own copy of the Book of Moses, here you'll have conveniently in each unit the listing of all of the priestly words in the order in which they appear in that unit, as you see here in Moses chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. As discussed above, the Levites' interest in, and one of their divining, defining virtues was their zeal in protecting and defending holy things, even at the high cost of, uh, in, of, of not putting first uh, interests in uh, immediate family needs or property. Righteous zeal comes, to play, comes into play in the book of Moses when, for example, in the first chapter, Satan confronts Moses amid his theophany. In response to Satan's demand for worship, Moses replies, Depart from me, Satan, for this one God only will I worship, which is the God of glory. Well, Moses' reaction is strong. It isn't what one would call violent in a negative sense. Rather, this case demonstrates the adamant zeal for the God of Israel that typifies the Levites. Later in the book of Moses, Enoch is forced to defend his people against their enemies by means of warfare. He led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. Blessed with the power of God, Enoch is able to repel the wicked and deliver his people. After his victory, the text relates, from that time forth there were wars and bloodshed among all the people that fought against God, but the Lord came and dwelt with his people. Here Enoch uses violence only as a means to protect God's work. Another Levitical role is presiding over worship, praying, and making inquiries to God. In the book of Moses, 
God commands Moses to call upon God in the name of his only begotten Son and worship him. Moses prays and calls upon God. Adam and Eve call upon the name of God and hear the voice of the Lord. Enoch prays and calls unto the Lord. And Noah calls upon the Lord. In regulating sacrifices, another one of their functions, offerings appear six times and sacrifices three times, playing another significant role in the book of Moses. And perhaps baptism, not just with fire, but also with the Holy Ghost, spoken of by God to Adam, foreshadowed the burnt offerings that would have come to be required for atoning sacrifices under the law of Moses. And for the priestly duties of teaching the law and keeping records, the book of Moses sets that precedent as well, as the children of Adam and Eve were taught to read and write, having a language that was pure and undefiled. Now let us draw a few conclusions. First, there are relatively few non-priestly elements in the book of Moses. But we hasten to add to mention that Moses was both a priestly Levite and then at the same time considered to be one of the greatest prophets that Israel had ever known, as Deuteronomy 34 makes clear. Meanwhile, while the modern concept of grace and of anthropomorphism are foreign to P, the more ancient idea of reciprocal grace is not absent here. And the real concern about anthropomorphism is simply to ensure that it does not lead to images and idol worship, which is guaranteed by the true order of worship instituted by the Book of Moses. Second, most of the unique materials in the Book of Moses can be classified as priestly. Chapters 1, 6, and 7 contain completely all or virtually all unique material. And chapters 3 to 4, in those chapters, priestly material is often found in place of implied verbal ideas, often changing the text of an implied to be verb and clarifying ambiguous verbal subjects. Since Hebrew is often ambiguous and relies heavily on implication, it is difficult to tell whether this particular Moses material is restoring missing ideas or supplying new information. In chapter 5, the unique material imputes satanic agency to Cain's actions, drawing attention to Satan's unholy oaths and covenants with wicked mankind. And chapter 8's material describes Noah as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, ordained after God's own order. This unique material most often interrupts texts attributed to J, texts attributed to P, which are already recognized for having a concern for Levitical interests, are more lightly touched upon by the Book of Moses' interpolations. Interestingly, the Book of Moses' unique material restores priestly material into places in the text attributed to the non-priestly J source. Thus, it may have been the case that Levitical or priestly materials, something like these elements found today in the book of Moses, were deleted from the most archaic versions of the primal history of Genesis. And third, to account for those deletions, one can easily argue that ancient scribes in working on producing Genesis would have had reasons to or needs to shorten the longer Moses text. Several such reasons come to mind. Now, the shorter text may have worked much better for a popular audience that uh, also would have eased instruction and memorization for them. Or perhaps the compilers wanted to give a more overall balance or, or preference to the materials in J, E, R, and H and other sources that would be included throughout Genesis and Pen the Pentateuch, and thus deleted some of the priestly material that was originally there. Or, perhaps, given the fact that Levitical and priestly materials would have been primarily of interest to only a fraction of the overall Israelite population, the abridgers might have intentionally decided on that ground against including any more. Indeed, the book of Moses uh, provides its own prediction and explanation for this future loss of such portions of the text, 
namely, the children of men shall esteem my words as not, as not important, not useful, no longer sufficient or relevant, and shall take them from the book which thou shalt write. In addition, these differences between the book of Moses and Genesis as deletions from a proto-Genesis might be further explained by the sacred nature of some of the passages in the book of Moses. And of course, Moses 1 ends with the instruction that it is not to be shared widely among the children of men. Other priestly matters speak of sacred places and duties that probably were maintained, nevertheless, within the confines of the holy sanctuary. And finally, the elevated ideals in the book of Moses of strict righteousness and cooperation between husband and wife and the goal of achieving a Zion community might simply have been politically out of reach and thus embarrassing during times of wickedness in ancient Israel, which were not infrequent. So the longer version of the primordial history in Moses may well have predated our shorter version in Genesis. Its presence on the brass plates would certainly be consistent with that proposition. In, in conclusion, while not everything in the Book of Moses is congruent with the interests of the hypothetical P source, much of its unique material has Levitical connections that could not have been previously noted or assessed. These intriguing connections tie the prophet, priest, and man Moses to the Latter-day Saint book of Scripture that bears his name. We and others, especially Hugh Nibley, have uncovered several very ancient-looking materials that were the ongoing and extensive course of study for the book of Moses. Still, most non-Latter-day Saint scholars, as well as some scholars within the Latter-day Saint community, see enough potential anachronisms especially in the early mentions of the gospel and name of Jesus Christ in this text to raise questions that need further addressing if one wishes to see it strictly as ancient. But those also can be accounted for in terms of the book being a translation. Nevertheless, the connection of anachronisms will be addressed at another time. But for now, if the book of Moses were not to contain these Levitical elements, some critics would no, no doubt wonder, how can this book possibly have originated with Moses, given his putative Levitical connections? At least that concern may now be curtailed. Moreover, these findings of a pervasive priestly character of this text underscores the unlikelihood that this text just originated with Joseph Smith. At a minimum, Joseph would have needed to know a lot about what it meant to act, think, write, live, and serve like a priest or a Levite in order to make him uh, able to think of Moses in these modes, let alone to have then produced this Levite-like -like book. Whether one assumes the book of Moses was recorded or included in the brass plates or composed at some later time in the first temple period or at some other time. The findings we present in this paper show as a formative step that this book in many fundamental ways fits comfortably and extensively into a Levitical domain and context. It rightly honors and reflects the magnificence of the religious, spiritual, and theological visions of the greatest prophet, priest, and leader Israel ever knew. As new questions now arise about the processes at work in its coming forth, all readers of the Book of Moses the Levite will hopefully be open to new interpretive doors that this approach, among others, affords for those seeking to better understand and enjoy the Book of Moses textually, historically, linguistically, ritually, and spiritually. Thank you very much.
Well, Jack, thank well, you for being here, and Jackson Abao. Uh, before we begin, uh, Jackson, would you mind just introducing yourself briefly? Sure. I'm a senior at BYU. I'm studying ancient Near Eastern studies with an emphasis in the Greek New Testament uh, with a minor in Biblical Hebrew. I've been working for Jack Welch for about two and a half years. We just finished up. Um, it's been a great experience, and it's, I've learned a lot from him. Wonderful. So to summarize uh, your paper briefly, and to clarify for some viewers, the documentary hypothesis uh, is a biblical uh, source criticism theory that proposes that there are various sources that compose uh, the books of Moses, and one of those is a priestly source, or P. And some scholars have argued that the P source may show up in the book of Moses, therefore undermining its historicity. However, it seems that you are arguing the exact inverse, that rather the book of Moses is in the P source in Genesis. Is that correct? We can go that way, yes. Uh, I think the reason that they usually think that if the presence of P is a problem is because the old assumption was that P has to be uh, exilic. That it wasn't until Ezekiel and Israel got to uh, Babylon that they needed to write down their priestly uh, language and traditions and so on. Uh, the uh, Silver Scrolls that I mentioned, uh, I think, say that at least some priestly texts were clearly available before they, uh, they go into uh, into Babylon, uh, and, and perhaps uh, there are other ways of arguing that, it, that the priests and the scribes would have been the ones who would have created even the other two versions of whatever types of texts for different purposes that might have existed. So, uh, Jackson, I don't know if you want to comment on that. You agree with that? I do, and, and as a general rule, the paper, I think, is ambivalent towards whether or not the documentary hypothesis may be true or not. And it instead focuses more on the observations of the scholars who, who have put together the documentary hypothesis. B.H. Um, Roberts said we ought to regard those, those methods as proper. So whether or not the conclusions of the documentary hypothesis are true or not, we're accepting their um, observations that these certain terms and ideas and principles may be priestly. Very interesting. One of the questions we received on this uh, topic is, I'm impressed at how closely you have considered interesting parallels with P interests. Have you been able to search for Moses content paralleling J, E, or D interest? If so, can you offer any comparisons or contrasts? And you did mention this a little bit in your conclusion, but if you want to just rephrase or elaborate. We, we, we didn't go in into this um, study with that, with that in mind. But it, I think it was interesting to see that um, where the J and E material shows up, that does seem to be where the priestly material is inserted in the book of Moses. And so if there is a pattern there, it's that more priestly interests are, are um, demonstrated in the Book of Moses than in the underlying text. Certainly. And of course, when it comes to source criticism, it's notoriously fickle and fraught, trying to determine and tease out, well, what could this, uh, this vocabulary word has to show up in this source, but not that source? And, and it can get uh, pretty convoluted. And uh, w one of the topics you guys touched on was the gap between God and man, and how uh, more intimate interactions would have been more rare it, which is what we see reflected in the book of Moses. Um, however, some scholars have pointed out that uh, the passages in, uh, in the Torah that talk about Moses face-to-face -face are non-priestly sources. But we do see that in the book of Moses, uh, where God talks to God face-to-face -face as a friend speaks to another. And uh, so what would you say about how what, what the presence of passages like face-to-face -face in the Book of Moses or the anthropomorphic qualities of God in the Book of Moses, or uh, you also mentioned the different names of God, what, would might, what might that suggest about some of these priestly themes in the Book of Moses or commenting on the other sources that create the, the Book of Genesis? I don't know if that makes sense. But. Well, as I mentioned, uh, if you view Moses as the high priest, or at least the prototypical high priest who sets forth all the rules that the high priest will use, uh, the high priest does enter into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Now, he goes alone. He's the only one there. So the normal text and the way that the text is presented to the population generally, that's irrelevant to them. But that the high priest sees God face to face, as Moses does, is a priestly function nonetheless. Well articulated, much more articulate than the way I asked that question. Um, so another question is that Moses is the great lawgiver among being the great priest. And you yourself have devoted much of your career and time to understanding biblical law and 
uh, law in the Book of Mormon. So I wonder if, did you detect any legal themes in the Book of Moses in addition to all these priestly themes? Well, one thing I think we have to realize is that the word law, Torah, in Hebrew doesn't mean what we think when we think of laws. Uh, rules with a, a command coupled with a sanction if you violate the rule. That's law under positive law, Western thought. Uh, but for, uh, for the word Torah means more teaching. It comes from the, the verb to teach. And uh, just think of how different it would feel if we called the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith the law of Joseph Smith. It's a big difference in our mind. But we have to then backtrack, and when we talk about the law of Moses, realize that they saw the law much more as a set of teachings. And of course, some of them talk about what you do and what you don't do, and sometimes punishments, but the law concept is much broader, and that's what we get in the book of Moses. Now, I have a theory that I've been toying around with, and you know, Moses comes down off the Mount, of Mount Sinai with what we've considered a higher set of rules or laws. And he breaks that tablet and goes back up a second time and comes back with the Ten Commandments because he knew that his people weren't ready for that yet. It may have been that that first set had more of this uh, type of material that we find in Moses as opposed to the more, okay, let's go through it by the numbers. Here are the Ten Commandments. Here are the Mishpatim. Here are the various uh, things you should do or not. But that's, that's a question I'm still still wrestling with and wondering when is what I'm interested in is finding out more about Moses a Levite and what he personally does to bring this book into existence and the big question there is well when when would he have written this book and uh, at what time in his life was it out in the desert with uh, uh, Jethro uh, or is it Maybe uh, that first time he's there with, uh, with Jehovah on the mountain. Or is it maybe as he's uh, finally putting together more of the instructions for what people are supposed to especially get out of the tabernacle experience when they come in and the priests then perform these sacrifices and the law of sacrifice and, and uh, go through the, uh, the holy place, which is a uh, recreation of the creation account itself. All of those would have been moments at which Moses uh, could have created this kind of thing. And so it's that plausibility uh, that I think helps me to position this, and Jackson's work focuses mostly on the terminological details, but there are also these broader thematic ones, which I think is you know, kind of what we're saying about law, having its broader thematic principles as well as its technical points. And that's a really excellent point uh, about the various perceptions of the word law, because as you've also published before, uh, law and ordinance can be very synonymous to each other. And we see concepts of ordinances in the Book of Moses as well through the institution of baptism, and Jeff Bradshaw has talked about the ascent literature in Moses 1. So I think there's, there's a lot of overlap there. All right, we do have another question. Uh, the idea of Genesis as edited as a shortened edition is interesting. Do you see a connection with the long and short versions of other works like Jeremiah, both of which were used at Qumran? Any thoughts on that? Um, that's a great question. I'm not as familiar with, with a Qumran text, especially with Jeremiah, but um, it does seem that in the, in the cases of the longer and shorter versions, the difference is the group that's using them and certain groups that have specialized interests seem to like the longer versions that have the that have the material that is relevant to their interests. And so, if we're if we're conjecturing a a longer priestly or text of Genesis, then it would make sense that the priestly group would have that longer text as opposed to a, the general population taking the shortened uh, and even um, harmonized text. I think that's right, and uh, I can add that Don Perry, years ago, working on uh, the Samuel scroll from uh, Qumran, was very interested that. Uh, there were uh, four or five places in the Dead Sea Scroll version that are longer than what we have in the Masoretic or the Septuagint texts. Now, the normal assumption is that the texts, uh, things have been lost, the things have been deleted, but uh, it can go either way, that uh, you may have longer texts in one place that are then uh, 
as, as Jackson says, added or deleted for individual purposes. Excellent. And uh, we'll just do one final question before breaking for lunch. Um, but uh, both your paper and that by Jeff Lindsay and Noel Reynolds, I feel like dovetail really nicely together since both of you seem to argue that the Book of Moses is an or text for other texts, such as you argue for the peace source in the Book of Genesis and they argue for the brass plates. So I imagine both of you have overlap a lot in your view of the brass plates. And so with that in mind, what might that suggest about the nature of some of the other Joseph Smith translation editions, the smaller ones, not the Book of Moses and the Book of Matthew, but the little edits? Do you also view those, those sorry, do you also view those as a restoration of ancient text or Joseph Smith's explanations or expansions? You know, there's many theories for what the JST might be or how it might function. I mean, that's a question far above my pay grade, but I'm not going to offer a few thoughts. Um, I think it's difficult to tell what the JST is supposed to be in a lot of places. Is it, is it supposed to be a restoration of original text, a retranslation, a commentary? I think, I mean, from my own reading, it seems to be, it varies from, from place to place. But the Book of Moses seems to be something distinct and something distinctly um, special. We talked about earlier in the presentations how it seemed to be reserved and held a special place that at the end of Moses 1 as it should be held from the, the, common, the common and profane view. So I think there's something special going on here, and I, I think it will take a lot of work to tease out exactly what that may be. I think that's right, and uh, uh, Bob Matthews long ago wrote a, uh, a description of the types of changes that are, are made in the Joseph Smith translation. Some are additions, some are deletions, some are done from one reason or another. Some conform with earlier texts. And uh, uh, I think that Brother Matthews was right that uh, as we go through each one, we shouldn't assume that the same kind of thing is going on throughout the, uh, the work on the Joseph Smith translation. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find this, the, you know, as we look more with this in mind, I. I don't think there are going to be priestly influences, uh, you know, throughout much of the uh, like changes in the New Testament for sure. Sure. Uh, but it's uh, but there we have to be alert to all the possibilities and uh, see which ones seem to make the most sense under each particular instance.